Yeah! What is up, guys? It's your boy Speed here, and today we're going to be looking at Game 2 between Viking GG and Tundra Esports, but I specifically want to hone in on initiating fights, okay? I know it might sound niche, but what you're about to learn today through Kezu's Tidehunter is going to teach you how to initiate fights on basically every single hero. Now, you're probably saying, Speed, but if I play Lion, surely Lion doesn't initiate the same way Tidehunter does. But the principles I'm going to be teaching you guys are going to apply to every single hero in some way or another. And you will see that and you're going to be like, wow, that's incredible. So nonetheless, smash the like button if you have more than five wins in your last 10 matches. Click the dislike button if you love Smurfs. So I, I know that that means if you dislike the video, I know you like Smurfs. All right, that's just be careful. Be careful. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. All right, we're going to be starting off with the draft. I know that's not exactly what I said, but I just want to go through the draft. I know people like when I do this from time to time, like the really like Dota psychos. So let's hop into it. All right, but nonetheless, before we get into the video, I just want to let you guys know that over on the Game Leap website, I'm about to do multiple, multiple replay analysis on different roles on different games that I've recently played. So if you want to get more in-depth content, definitely go check it out. You know, it, it, it's quite cheap for the price for the amount of content you're actually getting. It's a very good price. And so I, I think it's super worth it to go invest $8. If you're trying to get better at the game, you're going to get this content that's going to be more specific to, you know, what you need to the to the concepts and ideas that you need to get to the next rank. So, yeah, if you could support us and you want to support yourself, go click the link down below right now. Get a Game Leap sub and you're not going to regret it. I really believe that. First things first, we have first phase bans. You'll see even after 7.29D, AA is still getting banned. Why? Because it still makes you not heal. Then uh, we have Treant. This hero has exploded onto the scene. Definitely a position five you guys should be looking into. Enchantress, probably a, I don't know. I'm not going to say a broken hero. If you're good at it, you can put so much map pressure. You can create so much space. You can initiate fights. Uh, you just, I don't know. Good laning stage, good team fighter, which sounds weird because it's like, what team fight does she have? Vision. It's called Vision. Vision and information. Then we have a timber saw ban. Uh, that's probably just a Viking GG special. I think it is. I think Shad plays that hero like crazy, if I'm not mistaken. Then we see a Snapfire opener, another hero that got nerfed, but still is good. Still provides. It's kind of like an AA. Like I see Snapfire and AA as like relatively similar heroes. I know that might seem a little bit odd because they don't really play with the same heroes, but they give you this really long range team fight that provides you with damage. So it's nice. It's like this position four that gives you damage. We see a first phase Titan. Not something you see every day, that's for sure. Definitely not something you see every day, but uh, the first phase Tidehunter comes out from a Viking a GG. You might be asking why. Yeah, no idea. They clearly just like it and they want to build a team comp around Tidehunter, which is very often how Dota works. And uh, you see a Hoodwink. This lane is nuts. The amount of damage this lane does is, by the way, insane. Acorn Chop, Gush, dirty. Uh, and you Bushwhack them, dirty damage. It's so much damage. So I like this pick a lot. I think this uh, Hoodwink also covers a lot of bases. Um, for instance, it counters out like just having a break. Man, there's not a lot of breaks in the game. I, it really is like that. There's really just not. And so having Hoodwink, it limits the pool of like some of the broken heroes that I think you just don't want to play against. It's good against Dusa, in my opinion. Like Hoodwink is good against Dusa because it, it doesn't die to Dusa. It's really good at kiting Dusa. It breaks Bristleback. It breaks Viper. Um, it even breaks Medusa if that's what you're concerned about. And uh, just in general, breaks are so valuable. They just are. Like, for instance, Tidehunter. It's just, like, really awkward to play against Hoodwink because of the break. And so, yeah, there's that. Then we see a Puck return. Uh, it's good anti-team fight. Really nice to have a silence against Tidehunter. Even Coil is good against Tide to a large extent. Hoodwink as well, very slippery. So I like the, the Puck pick. Probably the main reason why they picked it is Coil plus Snapfire ulti is just freaking nuts. Like, it's so hard to play against that. So I, I like that combo. Then after that, we see a Response Juggernaut. This is clearly them just saying, hey... We want to carry hero that's reliable. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it makes a lot of sense why they pick carry here. Definitely good against Puck and Snapfire. Doesn't necessarily kill Puck, but it just doesn't die to Puck very easily. It's a, it's a very hard hero for Puck to gank, which is nice to have, right? Because Puck often ganks the safe laner when she hits level 7, 6, you know, and gets, a, gets some sort of rune. So I love having that. After that, we see a Death Prophet. Very odd. I will say that Death Prophet uh, is good against Tide, in my opinion. Um, you can just kind of go on him and become tanky and if he ravages you it's like all right you know hopefully you live through it if you have like kai assange maybe bkb you can even go and disc and uh you can run at him we see a line response makes sense very slippery heroes pick up a line good laner of a jug we see a life stealer in response to that good lane against tide so if tide's the off laner which it doesn't it's not necessarily off laner in this game i think it wasn't but it's good against tide 
it's an okay matchup against Jug. It's fine. Like that matchup's just it's it's okay. It's okay against Lion. I'm not like a huge fan of it against Lion to be honest. It can get kind of kited. Hoodwink. I would say it's good against Hoodwink. So it, it's like a decent life stealer game for sure. It lanes well with Snap as well. If you want to run that lane, it's definitely one of the better heroes. And these heroes definitely make life stealer not get kited that hard because they can all like sort of initiate or or do their thing. And that's good for life stealer. So I like that. And finally, we see Enigma come out. Really weird. Good against spin TP. So it, it prevents Jug from split pushing. That's that's like a big thing for me. It's a hard counter to Tidehunter. Enigma always has been and it always will be because he can't purge Black Hole, right? He can't purge Black Hole and Midnight Pulse can be hard for Tidehunter to get out of. So I think that is incredibly good. It also can cut all of Hoodwink's trees, which is a bit niche. But if you Midnight Pulse the, the Hoodwink Acord Shot Bushwhack combo, it does stop the stuns. So there is some value there. And um, yeah, they finished off with the Razor. This is them clearly committing to a little bit of cheese here. The Razor is the offlaner. The Tide is, I believe, a support, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, no. Is this their mid? Oh, maybe they, they must do like a lane swap. Because if you pick Razor here, I would imagine. I guess it's not a guarantee, but I would imagine you want it against Lifestealer in lane. I actually don't know. I Yeah, I don't know. All right, we'll get into the game, guys. Now we're going to be looking at the initiations, uh, primarily the team fights throughout the game. So if you want to learn about team fights, let's do it. All right, getting into the first fight of the game. This is a big one. I, I love this. This is such a great example. So I want to ask you guys a question. When you have Blink on Tidehunter, do you go in first, second, third, fourth, or fifth? Right, let's assume, you know, it's kind of a vague question. I know it's a bit, it's a bit of a trick question to some extent. There's no like perfect answer, but I just want you to think about that. Like that, that's what I want in your head as you go into this clip. When you go in as Tidehunter, right? First, second, third? It depends. Of course it depends. It's Dota 2. It always depends. It always depends. But looking at this clip here, with the Blink Dagger early game, especially early game, it's a 2.4 second stun. It scales up, doesn't get much better. But the point is, okay, as we look at this clip, you only want to go in when your team can follow it up. So this is what you should be thinking about. As I'll, I'll start to play at this clip. But if you have ranged heroes and backline heroes, you typically will go in first and earlier because they can easily follow it up from the back. If you have heroes that need to be closer, right? Heroes that need to maybe static link people or Omni Slash, then you should go in when they're in position. You just have to wait either until your team can follow it up or at least if you're going to like set up for them, right? Maybe you're buying time. It's weird to use Ravage in that way. Sometimes you can, but let's get into the clip. So right here, Lion ends up getting gone on. Okay. They want to take a fight. They got their Hoodwink in the area. They have the line. It looks pretty tempting, right? Why doesn't he just blink Ravage right away? Huh? Why not? Why not just blink go in right away? Because most people, I really want you guys to think about this, okay? This is the difference between Kesu, who I think is like 9 or 10k, I don't know, I don't He's something really high, okay? He's ranked like, what, what, what is he, 25? Really good at the game, okay? What most people do, and a lot of people make the mistake of, is they go in right here. I'll pause it when it's here. They go in right here. They would blink ravage this. And, and it looks, it's like, I'm the greatest! I get a three-man Ravage onto the Puck, onto the DP, onto the Black Hole guy. If, uh, you know, we lose the fight, not my fault. I hit everybody. That's where you're wrong, okay? That's where you're wrong. Because he wants to wait until this guy is in range for Static Link. Because if he Ravages right away, the Static Link might not last that long. Why? Because they'll be able to kite it out. They'll be able to help the person out. And so he wants to wait until Razor is in proper range. Razor gets much closer. They can get the link out and he goes in. I would even argue he was maybe like 0.5 seconds early. Obviously, let's not get into that right now. But you get the point, right? You get the point. Then obviously you're going to kite out after initiating. Okay, he gets run down. Whatever baits the DPN gets the kill onto her. But I just wanted you guys to see that as a starting clip. Let's move on to the next one. Next up, I want to look at this team fight in general. This team fight shows incredible, and I really mean incredible, positioning prowess from Viking GG. This is why this team has been performing extremely well. So in this fight, they're trying to take Roshan, right? They're trying to force the objective. They're they're basically trying to bait Tundra into them so that they can get a good Ravage, get a good Omni Slash and so on. And um, that's kind of what we see here. You can see they're kind of like setting up a trap and Tundra knows they're here for a little bit of context. This is this is very clear. Roshan's like half HP. They're poking and prodding. You can see once again, Shad's going to go in. Tidehunter would not want to go in first. Why? Because they have Tidehunter counters. And this is like a big thing to adjust to um, based upon the game. Let's say, for instance, they didn't have, you know, this hero, right? So they don't have this Enigma. Where is he chilling? Over here, right? They don't have this Enigma. Okay, in that case, if they don't have Enigma, then he could easily frontline. But because they do have Enigma, there's like a decent chance. He doesn't have BKB yet, to be fair. But there's a decent chance he just dies. 
right? And doesn't get any spells off. And that's a big problem, right? You do not want like a no response death um, as Tidehunter. And so you have to be very careful about that. In general, this game, they even have a life stealer, another hero that can go on Tidehunter, potentially kill him before he gets anything off, right? Maybe there's like a life stealer goes on him, snap fire ultis. Tide could die and not be able to ravage anyone in a proper way. Yes, he has four staff to potentially disengage from that. Love the item choice here. Uh, but you get the point, guys, right? You have to adjust based on the game. Shad on the Juggernaut is a much more suitable target to go in, considering he has a black hole to follow him up. And that's kind of what we see here. Good initiation from Tundra, in my opinion. It looks pretty good. Uh, unfortunately, the static link comes out. They get the Omni Slash on Jug as well. And this is a good ravage, right? He waits until the rage ends. Right, waits till the rage ends, does a great job. The the movement here from Kesu, this is what I'm talking about. The movement, the movement here from Kesu is super good. Kites away from the uh, the puddle thingies, waits at the rage, doesn't panic, right? Doesn't panic because a lot of people, they'd be like running in here, right? Right, guy? Really? Think about it. How many people would be like YOLOing it? You're a tight out there, of course you're supposed to, but then you wouldn't be able to blink. And so instead he chills on the side, waits for it, gets a really good ravage. Uh, even four staffs, which usually I don't recommend doing, but it's to catch a life stealer there, so it makes sense. It's a key target. And yeah, they, they went a very convincing fight. Unfortunately, 33 snatchy Aegis and got out with it, but you can see overall, fantastic fight, really good initiation, well played there. And um, yeah, that, that's another key to you know the, the positioning and patience and understanding whether or not you can die should dictate how you adjust your positioning in the fight. And that's hard. All right, and let's end the video here. Not exactly. We're going to look at one more fight. And after this fight, this is when the game actually ends. So let's get into it. I love his patience in this fight. And once again, I, I know I talk about patience quite a bit. In this game in particular, one thing I also forgot to know in the last clips that I think is a really good point, good tip, is when the enemy team has a lot of AoE, a lot of team fight, it's very important as the front line. Well, you're not actually the front line of this game. He's not building to do that. Right, makes sense. He's building as a kite, backliner, ravage bot, gush bot. He's going to play like it, which is good. You should always play like your items. Makes sense. But in particular, this game, they have a lot of AoE, right? And they have this black hole, they have this puck and snap. And so, like, grouping up is even worse. Uh, it's already bad, like I mentioned in the last clip, because it will cancel your blink, but it's even worse. So, let's get into this last fight here, kind of break down what he does. So, as the fight breaks out, another Roshan engagement. Uh, you can see he's, he's definitely looking at his minimap here. He does shift his camera down, but it is important to look at your minimap as well to see where people are, what's happening. Looks like even a little bit of split pushing action going on from Team Tundra, but once again, needs to have patience here. He doesn't want to blank ravage a life stealer, right? This is not value. This guy is super tanky, right? He has 47 armor, status resist, status resist, satanic. You're not going to, you're probably not going to kill him, right? And so he needs to be patient. BKB comes out from the Enigma as well. So you'll see his position. He's going to adjust to that. He'll throw out a gush, but then he just has to wait. Like, I think sometimes people struggle with this because it's like, oh, uh, should I really wait as Tidehunter? Like, isn't that really bad? And then now, last second, as the BKB just barely ends, throws out the, the Ravage, really nice timing, clips the puck on the back end, right? Hits the puck. This guy has no way on disc now. That uh, will get him killed. The Shad gets the, the Enigma as well on the back end of that as well. So it's a perfect, perfect Ravage. Refreshes. Bit of a misplay there. Uh, I don't think that one hit anyone, so bummer. Can't get them all. But uh, yeah, just another incredibly well played fight by Kezu. I felt like all these team fights, he was going in at the correct time. Very nice times. Just overall, uh, extremely good game by him. And I hope you guys can understand why the 0.5 second, two seconds you have to make these decisions and the decisions that the, the that people make in these these gaps of time completely changes the game. Um, you see, a lot of people would have just walked in, face planted in this game, and they would have died because they're countered. But they won't play like they're countered, and then they lose the game. And um, yeah, of course, remember, there's always the back half to this as well. If you're playing Tidehunter and sitting in the back the entire time with full HP, full mana, and you have, and you have Shiva's satanic, you're like one of those like beef Tidehunters. Then yeah, it's probably not good, and you should be playing to soak damage in frontline. Maybe your team needs you to do that. You don't have a juggernaut um, and the enemy team doesn't have direct counters to you. That that can happen and you need to adjust accordingly. So, but all right, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you learned a lot. Um, I know it was a very in-depth and um, educational video. And uh, yeah, if you enjoyed, consider signing up to Game Leap. I make a lot of videos like this over there. A lot of in-depth content that you're simply not going to get on YouTube. We post there every single day as well. And uh, I think you're going to love the content. So thanks for watching. Sign up down below. You're, really, you're missing out if you don't go get a Game Leap sub. At least go check it out.
By the way, there's a refund policy, so at least go check it out. You're not going to be disappointed. It's, it's so good. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one, and I'm out. Peace.